Welcome here. I'll talk if you'll listen. Episode 72. And back at it again. I'm really excited for the new connections that I made this week. So before I even check in on you all, I just want to say I'm really happy to have collaborate, collaborated with other creators, in particular other people who have podcasts. And it just, it's a level of fulfillment that I didn't know I needed or that I didn't know I could even appreciate. So shout out to all of the black podcasters out there and just podcasters in general. I was able to do a really cool collaboration by accident on my Instagram page last week on Wednesday. It's still up, so feel free to go and check it out. It was a really dope conversation. And... I'll tell you a little bit more about it after I check in on you. How you doing? What you been up to? This is the part where you pause the podcast to respond. But uh, <laughs> I hope everything's been great. I hope you've been doing well. Uh, I hope you're not sick. My buddy Joe got sick, and I find that summer colds are the worst. Because so there's there's a myth out there that a lot of people associate codes with the change in temperature and that's not entirely true but I find that in my opinion I much rather deal with winter colds than summer colds I don't know if it's the added moisture in the air you know the humidity or if it's just the heat but it just exasperates things so I hope Joe gets better I'll check on him I need to check on him And I hope for all of you out there who are dealing with allergies or any other ailments that you feel better. Me personally, I thought I was coming down with a cold. I actually got really nervous because it was uh, a really violent cough that I dealt with after hanging out with some friends. And I was under the impression like, oh man, here we go. But everything ended up being fine. I was fine by the end of that day. And I didn't have like a runny nose or sore throat or sore chest or anything like that. But unfortunately, it's the new normal now. You get a little tickle in your throat. You have a tough time swallowing. You have a runny nose, a headache. Your eyes are sensitive to light. And you know, hey, what's going on? And the first thing that you think of is, I was just around all those people who didn't wear masks or I was just around a bunch of people in a closed space. It really starts to get you to wonder like, oh man, do I have the COVID? You know, do I do I have the touch? Am I it? We're paying, playing a uh, tag here. And it's it's the new norm. That's what you think. You don't think it's just a normal code anymore. It goes it goes straight to it goes straight to that. So I can't wait till we get to the point where we can move past that fear. And maybe we won't, and it'll it'll just lessen. But I don't like being worried that I have a life-threatening disease or condition because I went to go hang out with some loved ones. Or what's worse is I did everything I needed to do, but because someone else was irresponsible or careless or inconsiderate, I ended up getting sick. That's like the worst feeling in the world. Where you do everything in your control. It's like you wake up on time. You leave out the house an hour and a half early. You bring your own lunch, your own breakfast. You don't need to stop. And then you're stuck in traffic and you end up being late to work anyway. It's like you did everything right, but everything just backfires. It, it It's like this feeling of helplessness that you don't enjoy at all. You just kind of want to avoid. So that's my biggest concern about about COVID is it's the helplessness. But that said, um, going back to the collaboration. So every now and again, I drop goodies on my social media. And last Wednesday at 7, I did a open discussion. It was the same format as this podcast is where my goal was just to kind of go live, start talking, and invite in whoever wanted to be invited in. And I did post something on my story. I think like the week prior, and I had a few people reach out like, hey, I wouldn't mind joining, et cetera, et cetera. So although we did have a few technical difficulties, I find that Instagram Live running on my iPad, although much more convenient because the screen is bigger, isn't as convenient when it comes from a 
tech standpoint. So there was some technical difficulties. Some people couldn't join. Some people had issues joining. But I went live at 7, and I had so many people join. I had people from the Two Kings 215 podcast join. I had someone else in the comment section participating. And it's killing me because I can't think. I'm I'm going to look it up after the break. Or when I take a break, and I'll tell you what it is after the break. But um, it was it was so cool to see people participating and adding to the discussion. So pretty much what we talked about, and not to go into the video too much. Because it's still up on the page. You can go and watch it. It's not too long. It's about the length of an episode or so. Probably about 90 minutes or so. And... We talked about money management, we talked about relationships, and we talked about adult learning. And the reason these topics were so engaging, in my opinion, was there were a lot of perspectives coming from different areas. Sometimes it can be really tough, especially for me, to have open discussions about things because sometimes, more often than not, whether it's intentional or otherwise, you come across people with the same mindset as you or coming from the same demographic or perspective as you same upbringing as you, and you find oftentimes you relate or agree on a lot of the topics discussed. Having so many people engage in the discussion, and it wasn't necessarily a debate of who's right or who's wrong, it was just an open discussion. It added the benefit of people coming in, dropping things that no one else considered, or at least I didn't think of. them. Oh, wow, I didn't realize you said that, or I didn't think that. So... In regards to money management, we talked about why people blame other things around them as opposed to what their own personal habits are. The surface answer was, well, it's easier to point the finger at somebody else than it is to take accountability and responsibility on your own. But there were some other answers that went a little deeper beneath the surface that I think you'd enjoy if you tune in and watch. On the topic of relationships, we talked a lot about standards versus expectations versus preferences. And that was a cool discussion because, and I'll actually hit on certain points of that topic in tonight's topic, one of tonight's topics, or this episode's topic, because it's similar, but we spoke about how sometimes your, what you think your standards and expectations are really are just preferences, but sometimes you got to have those milestones in your romantic life in order to realize, hey, you know what? I guess I don't really need a guy with a car or, you know what? I don't really need a woman with this type of figure or, you know what? I don't really need a woman who works full time or, you know what? I don't really need a guy who doesn't have a degree. You start to place value in other things, but I like to think that you got to go through certain points in your life to get you there. Sometimes you don't know that you like a episode, a, a show until you get to episode five. Sometimes you don't realize that it's not your type of show until you get through a whole season. And everybody's time clock and compass is different. And we discussed a lot of that, especially when it came to a woman's perspective at 40, a man's perspective at 30. And a young adult's perspective at 20. And it was a really engaging conversation. The last area was adult learning. And it was really cool because one of the guests on the Instagram live was a coach or is a coach. And he was able to really speak on a lot of perspectives on the way adults learn versus the way kids learn. And it was really cool. As a mentor and leader myself, I'm always interested on how adults receive information and how people in general receive information because I feel like the more knowledge I'm equipped with in that field, the better trainer, mentor, coach, leader I can be. And it was just such a good time. We had a rotating, revolving door of guests. So how it would work is... I will bring one guest in, and then I will bring another guest in, and then those two guests would go back to the comment section, and or at least become audience members again. Then I will bring two more people on, and 
we had a good mix. We had some men on, some women on, and it was a good, healthy round of perspective. So shout out to everybody who who joined. I really appreciate it. And it was it was fun. I, I definitely see more of that in my future. Collaboration is the key. And I think that's it helps me broaden my perspective a little bit. Because if it's one thing I love to do, I love to have deep, meaningful discussions that can potentially change the way I view things. Now, tonight, there are a few areas that I wanted to touch on. But I'm going to touch on the easiest one first. So when I think about how far I've come with the podcast and how much further I need to go, how much meat is left on the bone, and just the different areas that I can touch on, sometimes I get really excited. And like most creators, other times I get really overwhelmed. It can seem like a really daunting task. One disadvantage as a creator that you have is although you have full autonomy over your content and you can pretty much put out whatever you want, at times you do feel like you are at the behest of your audience. And it starts to become this game of chicken or the egg, where do you have your audience because of the content that you put out, so they're going to stay around regardless, just keep putting out what you need to put out? Or are they here because of the content that you put out was catered to them? And sometimes it's tough to walk that line. And you find yourself in a position of you come out with a show, you come out with an episode, you come out with a topic, and you only get 10 listens or 20 downloads compared to your normal 30, 40, or 50. You start to compare yourself to that. And now the competitive part, the competitor in you, it's like, I need to be 1% better than I was yesterday. So yeah, of course, I'm going to compare my current week numbers to my previous week's numbers. But there's another part of you that goes like, hey, don't look at stats. Don't look at numbers because then you'll get lost in the numbers and you'll start competing with this imaginary thing that isn't really even there or at least isn't really as meaningful. Just put out content. Just put out content that you love, that's fulfilling, and the people who listen and who enjoy it will continue to do so. And if somebody doesn't want to listen, that's fine. That's just more space for someone else. And it can be really hard, or rather really easy, to fall on either side of the fence. One week you're down in the dumps because you can't find good content to put out, or you can't find something good to talk about. On the other end, you're, you're experiencing this high where you feel like everything you touch becomes gold. You're on a roll. You're getting great engagement, great numbers, and it can be really fulfilling. I think both parts are really important for the journey because it helps you appreciate everything about it. When you have those low moments, it helps you appreciate the high moments. And when you have those high moments, you learn to appreciate it because a low moment could be just around the corner. So the low moments also put things into perspective for you, letting you know that you've never arrived. And One thing that I wanted to talk about is having a role model or mentor when it becomes when it comes to being a creator. I classify being a podcaster as being in two fields, both in the radio category and in the creator category. And if anything, it's kind of the child of both. If radio and vlogging or blogging had a baby, it'd be podcasting. And although podcasting can be different from a lot of other creative fields, whether it be you're a Twitch streamer, you are a radio personality, you are a YouTuber, there are a lot of things that overlap. And if you can find a mentor or a role model that excels or at least does something that you hope to do very efficiently, you should latch on to that person. It's kind of like not having a million dollars so you surround yourself with people who are millionaires to kind of help you get to that point. And it's more mental, 
However, there is a level of work ethic there too. And I'm going to be very honest and probably make someone's head much bigger than it needs to be in this here segment. Now, one of my friends I met way back in 2008. He and I instantly clicked. We were gamers, still are, and we enjoy being in social settings around one another. We got really, really close, and to this day, I consider this guy like my brother. And very early on, he kind of dove into the YouTube area. In the really early 2010s, he may have even had a channel as far back as 2009, I believe. And he just decided to have a page on something that he enjoyed, and it was battle rap. He loved battle rap. He loved the creativity of it, the art behind it, the production, the gritty atmosphere, and of course, most importantly, the culture. And he started to report on it. And then 2012 came around, and there was a very infamous battle. And he had a reaction video to the battle. And this wasn't his first reaction video. But that video really was a catalyst for everything to come after the fact. So he started increasing his presence at a lot of different battle rap events. He picked up the steam on his channel and started dropping videos at an alarming rate, a very consistent rate. And years later, now 2021, he's a partner with a few different startups and he has a few other things in the works and he has hundreds of thousands of YouTube subscribers and he's doing what he loves. This past weekend, he was at an event. He even got to meet other people that are really cool, like Drake, as an example. And it just, it's really inspiring for me to see. Now, I share this to make a point that this particular guy uh, by the name of Jay Black is a really dear friend of mine, and I love him. I don't think he'd ever realize how much I love him. I don't think he'd ever realize how much of an inspiration he is to me. But I bring this all up not to praise him, not to brag and say I know Jay Black. Some of you may not even know who that is. Battle rap is a very niche hobby. But he inspires me in such a way to want to take myself to the next level. And I don't think he realizes it. And even if I were to share it with him, and I have in some occasions in the past, I don't think he'd ever fully grasp or I could do a, f a good enough job of explaining what he means to me. And I share this to let all of you know that sometimes inspiration is unpredictable. And it's really important to have people or at least a person around you that has unprecedented passion, a crazy work ethic, and you just genuinely enjoy being there in their presence because it, it'll it'll push you to levels that you didn't even think existed. Whenever I feel myself slacking off, whenever I feel like I hit my ceiling or whenever I feel uninspired, I come across some of his content or I talk to him or I get a random thought and it just reignites that fuel. It just, that spark gets lit and it's just, that's all she wrote. People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And that's a huge part of it too. Because I know he cares about me and I know he is my friend. So he wants to see me succeed. So there's that too, which makes it much easier for me to take advice from him and to kind of look at him as like, a blueprint, so to speak, or at least a base or a starting point. Another thing that helps me is 
knowing that, hey, it's almost been 10 years, if not over 10 years, for him doing what he's been doing. And it's really easy for people to sit back and look at a Drake or look at a Tyler, their creator, or to look at a, even, you know, for women, like, you know, all these different actors and actresses out here, Scarlett Johansson, Angela Bassett, um, Letitia Wright, to look at these people and see what looks like overnight success can be very encouraging or discouraging. And I know the type of person that I am, it needs to be tangible. I need to see it. Because it's really easy to look at some people, especially if you haven't really watched their journey. Like I look at creators, content creators like uh, Caleb City or RDC World, the guys over there, um, in particular Mark Phillips. And I look at you know Long Beach Griffey and King Batch and some of the guys at um, College Humor, if that's even still around. And I remember when they were just putting really grainy, poor quality videos out that you would see on Vine or Facebook every now and again. And now look at them on TV shows and other networks and have a really huge presence and are at conventions, crazy sponsorships, great content, tons of subscribers. And for me, I'm the type of person where I need to see that type of progress real time. And it brings me back to Jay Black to be able to go and look at, you know what? All I got to do is keep my nose to the ground. I've only been doing this for three years. Um, yeah, three years. And who knows what could happen seven years from now? Who knows what could happen five years from now? All it takes is one episode, right? Because it's really easy to look at all these other people and see what seemingly looks like overnight success and for you to go, man, that'll never happen to me. Or this is one in a million. And sometimes you find yourself in a situation where you go like, oh, just you wait. And then you got people at 35 still rapping and never made it out of their local radio station. At some point, you kind of go like, am I giving up too early or am I fighting losing battle? I think it's important. I think everybody needs a Jay Black to look up to because it it's really helpful to see steady progress and tangible progress and for you to be able to recall like I know where he was at in 2017. I know where he was at in 2014. I know where he was at in 2012. And to be able to go okay, if he did this through hard work and determination and consistency, then I know I can do it too. So you become what you see. It's really important to surround yourself around, not always with like-minded individuals, but with people who aren't like-minded in a way that they are already at, or at least they've already achieved what you achieved. I get a certain level of fulfillment when I talk to my buddy Ryan and my buddy Chuck about work and professional ambition and professional standards and work ethics. And we bounce ideas off of each other and we talk about, we vent about work. We talk about some issues that we could have and how to overcome them. And it's this level of joy and fulfillment that I can't duplicate anywhere else. But when I have my large brothers who are decades older than me talk to me about work, it's a different type of feeling. It's a different type of, okay, th- these are the tools I need to learn and internalize now so that way I can be where they at, if not past where they're at, when I'm their age. And that's why it's important to have people in your peer group who are like-minded, but also people who are out, aren't necessarily your peers and they've achieved the level that you one day wish to achieve. So hopefully... If you don't already have a mentor or someone to look up to or someone who inspires you, this will be your motivation to go and seek that out. Sometimes the best mentorship is unintentional. It's natural, just happens organically. And sometimes it's nice to just watch somebody from afar because it allows you to be motivated, but also remain kind of like sovereign. Unto your, own, unto your own creative process. All right. So that may have been a little too deep for the intro, but I definitely had to get that off my chest. And hopefully that touched some of you out there. 
I'm going to take a brief break, get my notes together, and I'll be back on the other side of this break. Hey, y'all, I'm back. So I went to go look for the podcast, but when rewatching the Instagram Live, it doesn't show you the comments real time. So I can't think of the other young ladies podcast who participated in the IG Live, and I feel bad about it. But um, nevertheless, go and check it out because I know we mentioned it inside of the actual audio or video. I just don't know what timestamp it is. All right, so the main course for tonight. So my buddy Ryan, who has been featured on the show before, posted something that was very interesting, and it kind of led to a certain thought process. And I wanted to talk about it tonight. So first, I got to set the basis on who the people are before we get to the quote. So. For my 2000s teens and or young adults, you all may be very familiar with R&B singer Sierra. I think she's a model now because I don't think she's putting out much, if any, music at all. But she was very prominent in the 2000s, early 2000s, and she came out with great music, came out with songs like Oh and One Two Step and Goodies. And uh, she was just uh, fun to watch. She was a great dancer. She was beautiful, attractive, long legs, um, and really great music, obviously. So she, at some point in her young career or young life, ends up dating this rapper by the name of Future. Now, Future is the guy that when women say men aren't crap, and that's the censored version, that they're talking about Future. Future is what most women who have been wronged by men feel that men are. Future is the mascot of ain't crap dudes. They got together, they found themselves attracted to one one another, and they eventually had a kid. But it wasn't a great relationship. It wasn't a positive one. Future is very manipulative. He was very unfaithful. He fooled around with a lot of women, both in and outside of his relationships. And it didn't work out. So ultimately, Sierra gets out of that relationship and she comes across another gentleman by the name of Russell Wilson. He is the quarterback of the NFL's Seattle Seahawks. He's the guy that most women want to introduce to their parents. He's the guy that most women feel proud to be around. He's the well-groomed, Probably always smells nice, well-spoken, charming, wears matching clothes and family photos type of guy. And I think Sierra needed to go through a future to get through some to get to someone like a Russell Wilson. Now that we know all of the parties involved, let's get to the comment that led to this discussion. So my buddy Ryan shared a post that said, women don't want Russell Wilson. They want Future to act like Russell Wilson, which was deep. I think that comment is very layered. It goes to show you that women don't necessarily want this nice guy, right? They want the bad guy that they're with to act like the nice guy. I read this as something different, and here's my comment verbatim on Ryan's post. Another way to read this is women don't want a man who has already grown, has matured, and is stable, but rather they want a man like Future who they can fix or change into a Russell Wilson. Now, my buddy Ryan responds to add to the discussion. He goes, I'm not sure I agree. I think the mindset is more so being with someone who is more aggressive, for lack of a better word, as opposed to Russ, who comes off more reserved and clean cut. As far as fixing Future, or a guy like Future, Ryan goes on to say, I see that at times too, but I almost feel like it's in their nature. It's a good thing. Women keep you, women keep you up on your S word. Your homies do too, but women deliver a different type of motivation. 
especially if y'all are together and she's really rocking with your plan for success. So I liked it, and I told Ryan I get his perspective. But I went on to say I'd like to say that a good thing isn't always the right thing. From my perspective, women can sometimes approach fixing a man in the same manner they would raise their child. The woman's approach is oftentimes from a place of, I know better, or look what I did, rather than, I care about you, so I want better for you. Lastly, I went on to say, I believe that men need to be better at wanting to understand where women are coming from, while women need to improve at helping the man reach his goals instead of pushing him towards her idea of what he should be. Now, the whole basis around this discussion is women have this idea of a man, and they don't necessarily want that man, but they want to make that man. They want to get the guy, the one that they're attracted to, the one with the leather jacket, the one with the shades, the one with the nice car, and they want to kind of groom him or change him or, air quotes, fix him in a way where he's presentable by her standards. Now, I think this discussion oftentimes gets lost in the woods when you come around standards and expectations versus fixing. I think a lot of women, more in particular, the defensive ones, will try to defend their stance by saying, no, I just know what I want. I know what my standards are. And I need to be a, uh, with a man who uh, you know, meets those standards. But I'd argue, well, why not go for a Russell Wilson? A Russell Wilson will meet those standards. Now, of course, this is just for the sake of discussion. We don't know what Russell's imperfections are. Not any man. No man is perfect. No woman is perfect. But just for the sake of discussion, let's just say Future is the bad boy and Russell Wilson is the clean-cut, finished product that most women would like to be with. I think women want a future that they can mold into a Russell Wilson. They see an opportunity to nurture and to kind of put their stamp on it. Like, look what I did. Especially when they get around their other friends. I think a lot of them are in this really weird twilight zone of competition of, look what I did with mine type of thing. And you oftentimes hear these stories of, oh, you should have seen this place before I came along. Or you should have seen how he was living before I came along. Or how he dressed. Or what his hair used to look like. Now he's clean cut, now he's presentable, yada, 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 yada. Or you should have seen what he was making until I, until I came along. Or he thought Olive Garden was a five-star restaurant until I came along. And it somehow comes from a place of pride, like not in a good way either. Kind of like, look what I did. Now, I think some women out there look at a guy and they see that he already has his goals in his direction. And she helps him get to that point. I think that's the ideal woman that most men want. They want a woman who can put things into perspective for them. Hey, I want to make this much money, but I don't know how to get there. And a woman kind of helps that journey or that path. Or, hey, I want to come out with a podcast. Or, I want to fix cars. Or, I want to start my own business. And I'm not quite sure how to get there. And then a woman comes along and assists or supplements the man. I think that's the ideal situation when it comes to grooming or helping or assisting. I think when you take this approach of, this is what I want right now, but this is not what I want 10 years from now. But I'll be fine because I can turn this guy into what I want 10 years from now. Or what's worse... 10 years from now, he'll be who I want him to be. And you start to look past who the person you're with on who the person could be or what you think they should be. And you don't really appreciate where they currently are in the moment. And it ends in failure. I actually have a few articles that I'm going to read after a break. But I do want to point out the fact that I think there's two things going on that aren't helping each other. I think women are approaching this from the wrong way. And they're just kind of taking a step of, this is where you need to be. I'm not going to tell you why. This is just where you need to be. 
And I think men do a poor job of expressing where their goals are. I think ultimately women want security. Women want stability. And they feel like a man isn't in a position to offer that. They either either try to force their idea of what that is on the guy, push him towards that direction, or they leave. Now, again, there's going to be certain women and certain men who listen to this and go, that's not true because I'm not like that. There are also going to be certain women and certain men who go, well, no, I have a right to to have these standards. And there is a very thin line. I like to say this. There is a very thin line on what your standard is and what your idea is of what someone should be like. A standard is kind of a set of parameters in which you feel like you need in order to be happy, in order to feel comfortable. An idea of someone is how they dress, how they behave in social settings, what their interests are. I think when you sit down and you want the guy to be in a family photo with you with matching clothes with your two kids, that's an idea. That's not a standard. I think a lot of times people don't know how to define the two. I think what needs to happen is Men, we need to reach out to our male peers and friends and comrades, and we need to encourage them in ways that can help them communicate what their goals and desires are. So that way, when a woman comes along, a man can say, hey, this is the path that I'm on. I need a woman to help me get there. Instead of seeming like this directionless buffoon who never really had to think about it before, I think that's why it's so important to have a male role model, a positive male role model, preferably a father, in a man's life to kind of help give that archetype of what that goal or that direction or that success looks like. Women, what needs to happen is we need to stop talking to other women, trying to brag about how we fix the man that we're with, or how someone is such a good guy because they fit our idea of what a good guy is. Just like I mentioned earlier, for men, a good guy isn't always the right guy, and a good woman isn't always the right woman. Sometimes people do need a future, the rapper, not the future, as in not lowercase f, capital F. (laughs) Sometimes people do need to experience a future in order to appreciate a Russell Wilson. But... When people are ready to experience that, it's different for everybody. And I don't think we should put this idea of what a relationship should be like or what it should sound like on other people who maybe aren't necessarily ready for that. I said it once before, I'll say it again. People don't care about how much you know until they know how much you care. And the more we start to try and understand people, the more we can help them achieve their goals. I got a little bit more for you on the other side of this break. Stay tuned. So when I try to find topics or do research for topics, I come across some interesting articles from time to time. I came across an article on psychology today and I love these types of articles because it really breaks down the science or in this case the psychology behind certain thought processes and I think it's really cool because it's not it's not too anecdotal sometimes it can be but it really gets into the rationale or reasoning behind certain thought processes and I came across this article on psychology today by um a psychiatrist by the name of Seth Myers. Now, this is a really dated article. It goes all the way back to July of 2012. But I like to think that there's some key ingredients in this that can still make for a good dish. It's titled, Loving Broken Men, Rescuing Mr. Potential, Part 1. 
Now, in this title alone, it kind of goes back to the topic that we were talking about before the break, where I think a lot of women in general fall in love with who the man could be. And same thing with men who try to groom women to a certain space. It's you falling in love with what the woman could be for you, and you're not appreciating who they currently are. And in some cases, you're not separating yourself from who they currently are. The subtitle underneath the title says, Rescuing Wounded Souls Inevitably Ends in a Failed Relationship. So let's go ahead and read this, dive into this article. It's not a long one, and it's broken up into two parts. Now, I did not read this article yet, so I will be taking pauses and giving my two cents when needed. The article starts with, if we filled a fountain with a quarter for every woman who's loved and tried to save a broken man, we could probably fill Niagara Falls. This destructive relationship pattern, what I call rescuing wounded souls, is one of the most common relationship problems that we face, that face women today. The rescuer is a woman who attaches herself to partners who are emotionally unstable in some way. Though rescuers can be both men and women, the book I wrote on the subject, Overcome Relationship Repetition Syndrome, was primarily for women. So, you might ask, what does the rescuer do and feel in her relationships? It's a good question. The rescuer focuses on and worries about her partner more than she does about herself. Repeatedly, she finds herself with partners who, at first, seem sweet and have tremendous potential, but before long reveal themselves to be emotionally volatile, unstable, aggressive, controlling, unhappy, or unable to cope with some aspect of their lives. Many men who rescuers try to save struggle with depression, severe anxiety, or addictions of some sort. And I want to take a pause and add my two cents in there. I think that's really deep and it's starting to make me feel really um, an immense amount of sorrow for the rescuer who is uh, a woman in particular. Because I think although abusive relationships in general, you can't say an abusive relationship for a woman is worse than an abusive relationship for a man. I can't. You can make the argument that it is, it is at least different, and I feel sorry for those women who are in those type of relationships because I find that women are much more emotionally attached, and or they seem to get much more emotionally attached than men do, so it's harder for them to pull away from those relationships. Okay, two cents deposited. Let's move on with the article. You might ask yourself why a woman would stay with such a man. For the rescuer, she values love and relationships above all else. When she commits, she is fiercely loyal and she will die trying to help him realize his true potential. Rescuers also often come from families in which they felt the need to take care of a sibling or parent, or in which there was a high level of turmoil and drama. Though she desperately tries to help her partner, what she's really trying to do is change him. Other men who are her equals and who are emotionally available often seem boring. What's more, the love of a man who is emotionally whole wouldn't seem like real love. For these women, love is about work and sadly, suffering. The ultimate question is, Is she programmed to repeatedly save broken men, or can she break the habit and rid herself of the self-destructive relationship approach? The answer is a full-throated, yes, she can change, but only with disciplined work and self-exploration. My book takes women step-by-step through breaking the cycle. The starting point is to realize that your identity is the root of the problem, and that you see yourself as someone who has dysfunctional relationships 
and doesn't know how to be attracted to her equal and sustain a relationship with him. What I've found from many years of clinical experience is that a simple model can be used to help people change significant problems. Insight plus behavior change equals identity change. Accordingly, the way to change this dysfunctional relationship pattern is to first gain insight into how and why you feel the need to rescue wounded souls, and then engage in a series of new behaviors which would lead to a changed identity in your relationship. In part two of this series, I'll go through these steps in detail so that you can set yourself on a new course to change. So then, of course, you can't have an ending paragraph like that and go, oh, okay, I'm done. So I decided to click on the link and I'll take a look at part two. Now, this is my first time seeing part two, and luckily it's not too long. So I'm going to continue with part two right after a really small break. Okay, Loving Broken Men, Rescuing Mr. Potential, part two. Changing your behaviors is key to romantic success. The only way to change who you're attracted to is to change your behaviors first. If you find yourself attracted to, a, to broken men, men who have tons of potential but haven't yet owned up to it, you repeat a pattern I call rescuing wounded souls. In part one of this post, I described who the rescuer is and how the rescuer feels in her relationship. Now, I'm going to review some behaviors that will help you solidify a new identity, one where you learn to say that you would never again waste your time rescuing a wounded soul. After all, unless you're a paid therapist, it's not your job to act like one. Tim's two cents. Okay, that's deeper than rap. There's so many people who have never went to plumbing school, but they try their best to plumb anyway. Um, okay, y'all, that was a joke. Clearly, it's called fixing pipes. But point being is there are a lot of people who try to do things just based on their experience. And there's one thing to offer insight and support and all these other things, right? But it's a, there's a, when you try to fix someone and that's your intent, you can find yourself making a situation worse than it really is. It's really easy for me to go on YouTube and try to see how to patch a drywall, right? But if I want it done right, I need to either A, put myself through the training to get it done right, or hire someone who can get it done right. And I think that can be said for everything, including people. You have people who have been through a lot. Let's face it, y'all. We have been beat up. We've had traumatic childhoods. We have a lot of we've had we have had a lot of drama in our lives. Growing up, I ran away from home a few times. There are a lot of things that I'm not even aware of that currently impact my relationship, let alone the things that I've learned through therapy. And for us to try to take this hero and save Mr. Potential or Mrs. Potential role. I think, in a way, is irresponsible. And I think we really need to get our head out of our own butts and realize that we're not cut out for this type of job, and nor should we feel like we need to be. The article goes on to say, learning how to avoid men who are wounded souls and make yourself more attracted to men who are your actual equal isn't easy, but it's possible. I spend many chapters in my book, Overcoming Relationship Repetition Syndrome, discussing specific tools and techniques you can use, but I'll review two here that you can use to change your relationship patterns. One critical step in changing is conducting interviews with people who have good romantic relationships, and those people could be friends or family members. The key is to ask only two or three people you can trust to be kind and not judgmental with you. Start by explaining that you're dealing with a relationship problem that you want to solve. Describe your problem, the pattern where you tend to rescue wounded souls, etc. Ask if your confidant was aware that you have this problem, 
even if you already know the answer, and ask your confidant why he or she believes that you engage in this pattern. Why is conducting interviews important? First, because you need to admit to yourself and someone else that you have a problem. Second, because you need to open yourself up to the idea that someone else might be able to help you solve the problem. Now, that's huge. I want to take a step away from the article real quick and say that that's huge. I know or have known women in relationships that they didn't enjoy being in or that were physically and or emotionally abusive, in some cases verbally abusive. And they, when you kind of go to them, they won't hear anything. To have them come to you is huge. And I think one thing that um, Dr. Myers here points out is conducting the interviews and asking, like, hey, do you think this is a problem? Or did you know that this problem exists? But more specifically, why do you think I keep doing this? Like, why do you keep, keep why do you think this is a thing that I keep coming back to over and over and over again? That's huge. And I think that can, especially if you have honest friends and family members in your life, that can be a really huge uh, turning point. Another step in changing and learning to avoid broken men is to create and use daily affirmations. In mental health, therapists refer to this concept as self-talk, which describes the running inner dialogue that we all have in our minds in response to the things that happen in our lives. For example, when something bad happens to you, do you tell yourself that you did your best? Or do you tell yourself that you always come up short and should have tried harder? What you tell yourself is your own self-talk. And evaluating the type of self-talk you engage in is critical when it comes to your romantic relationships. Using affirmations or positive self-talk can make a huge difference in the romantic decisions you make because you program yourself to feel good about yourself and to protect yourself from emotional pain. Some affirmations that help include, just because I haven't had a good relationship yet doesn't mean I can't seek one out in the future. Or, it's just a matter of time until I start making better decisions and meet a guy who's my true equal. Repeating these mantras to yourself, particularly when you feel down or start to question yourself, can make a huge difference in your life. If you practice this technique on a daily basis, you will start to feel more confident and positive, and you will start to make better romantic decisions. In my book, I review these and other techniques in detail, providing the foundation for a significant and lasting change. If you're truly committed to learning how to have a relationship with a man who's strong and consistent, give yourself several months to practice these techniques. Quickly, you will start to see the difference in your love life, and you will find that the appeal of a wounded soul who offers little but potential is suddenly much less appealing. So, the, that article was um, really fun to read. Um, and I came across another article, but it's much too long for the show, but I'll just still give you the, the link. Um, so it's called, it's titled to the women who repeatedly attract broken, emotionally unavailable or addicted men. It's written by a young lady by the name of Haley Pace. This was written, uh, September 10th, 2018. And according to this, it's an eight minute read. So maybe I should read it. Yeah, how about I read it? I don't see the downside in reading it. Yeah, let's see. Eight minute read, that's not too bad, right? The article starts with, many people walk around with tattoos with invisible ink on their foreheads. Welcome to the Rehabilitation Center for Broken Boys. Because emotionally stable, mature individuals do not even fly on their radar. Yet if they're wounded somehow, they find these types irresistible. Many chalk it up to the bad boy allure and kept riding the same roller coaster with different names and faces for many years. 
And so they pick up Robin Norwood's 1985 classic, Women Who Love Too Much. Reading this book sharpened many people's focus around the cyclical pattern of subconsciously choosing partners they couldn't genuinely form a healthy connection with. This book pushes the reader to begin to take ownership in who they are attracted to and the role they play in partnerships. So if you relate to even a little bit with falling for unavailable men cyclically, I strongly recommend you read this article. Even better, pick up her book. Nilward touches on the disclaimer in her book, and I'd like to repeat it before diving in myself. Men can certainly fall in the same paradigm, but due to cultural and biological factors, they tend to avoid pain through pursuits that are more external and impersonal than relationships. As Norwood states in her book, the man's tendency is to become obsessed with work, sports, or hobbies, while due to the cultural and biological forces working on her, the woman's tendency is to become obsessed with a relationship, usually with a damaged and distant man. As she states, her book, and hopefully this article, will be helpful to anyone who loves too much, but is primarily written for women because loving too much is typically a woman phenomenon. Men's childhood trauma will usually evolve to other addictions and obsessions revolving around accomplishments and ego, rather than this sort of addictive behavior in relationships. As I move forward, I'll be speaking mostly in her, him terms, As to her, as the love-addicted party, but feel free to insert whichever pronouns work and resonate for you. I feel like a quick disclaimer that she had to put that there (laughs) because of the society that we lived in in 2018 and even now in 2021. If this article was written 10, 20 years ago, I don't think that little pronoun thing would be there. But such is our society now. You could also argue that it's inclusive, which is always a good thing. You want people to relate to the article, right? Okay. Tim, shut up. Keep reading. Okay, here we go. Norwood describes a woman who loves too much as an individual who finds herself attracted to trouble, distant, moody men. Dismissing nice guys is boring. She'll neglect her friends and interests to be available to him. She'll feel empty without him, although being with him is paramount to her overall fulfillment. She'll live her life strapped into a permanent roller coaster, cruising on each high from her partner, then feeling depressed during each low. So much time and energy is consumed around pleasing him that her life begins to slip away from her hands. Her life becomes tunnel vision around him, and slowly her hobbies. Friends, and life outside of him drips away until her entire world is chasing and taking care of this man who doesn't even provide her with a consistent, healthy relationship. So why do some women find themselves in a pattern of this sort of relationship again and again? When we date anyone, we date his or her psychology. We pursue those who fit into our vision of what a partnership looks like, which can often stem from family dynamics, subconscious programming, or past traumas. We are magnetized towards the individuals that fit our view of what love is. We chase people where we can repeat relationship roles we're accustomed to. This is all lovely if you have a spotless childhood, and possess a healthy psychology. For many people, though, love has taken a warped definition, and they will pursue individuals that play into their damaged psychology. The detached will be drawn to the codependent. The addict and the nurturer will be drawn together. The narcissist and the empath will glue together. The psychologies just fit together to what they are accustomed to. So there's something in the woman who loves too much mindset that makes the emotionally unavailable man 
look irresistible and a suitable candidate to pine for. Our minds work in overdrive when we're sizing up a person, when we're trying to figure out whether or not they could be a potential match. You might find a fellow standing at the corner of the party rude and disinterested, but Elise, who grew up in a home where her father was permanently detached, may find him magnetic. Krista, who grew up with an alcoholic parent, will feel comfortable when her mate gets too drunk. She knows how to tuck him in, give him a blanket, leave out a couple of aspirin for the morning, because she's seen her mom do it for her dad her whole childhood. Trista grew up with a narcissistic father, so when John exhibits the same over-the-top, grandiose qualities, it feels like a very normal, very safe role for her to take on. And that's the sort of masculine figure she grew up with. Beyond just childhood, this style of relating could certainly stem from other external factors, such as self-esteem, past relationships, fear of intimacy, emphatic auras, or being a natural healer. Or rather, that's empathic auras, or being a natural healer. This need to caretake may stem from a naturally nurturing personality, but typically, it is embedded into these individuals as a technique to survive. Their fear of abandonment or anxious attachment style translates to, if this person needs me, they can't leave me. It comes from a deep need to control the outcome of the partnership. By keeping the other party dependent on them, they feel they can't be left. Wow, that is deep. Damn, I got to read that paragraph again. This need to caretake may stem from a naturally nurturing personality, but typically it is embedded into these individuals as a technique to survive. Wow. Damn, I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry to mess up the flow of the the article, but that hit heavy. Their fear of abandonment or anxious attachment style translates to If this person needs me, they can't leave me. It comes from a deep need to control the outcome of the partnerships by keeping the other person by keeping the other party dependent on them. They feel they can't be left. Wow. Wow. Oof. Sorry, that uh that hit heavy. (laughs) The article goes on to say. For women who love too much, their idea of what love is wrapped around taking care of another human being. Therefore, when a woman who loves too much meets a stable, caring, together man, she will get a subconscious vibe that she is not able to love him. Love for her is fixing. Love is a project. Love feels distant and cold. If a man needs no care taken, and she does not have to chase him, so he's not even on her radar for a romantic relationship. Yet when an angry, elusive, detached, or addicted man comes her way, she sees a project that she can pour their love and devotion to. The wound is her siren's call. This style of relating turns love into a drug, a high, so to speak. The cycle of chasing, avoiding, coming back together, dramatic fights, messes with both lovers' brain chemistry, and keeps both hooked on the drama. Nord argues in her book that for these individuals, it is an addiction, one that can be just as damaging and wreak just as much havoc as alcoholism and any other addiction can. Rather than, ner- rather than turning to a bottle or a drug to avoid dealing with one's problems, Women who love too much place all of their energy into trying to fix or to take care of of broken people. This, too, is its own high. And the descent into addiction and increasing chaos over one's life follows the same pattern. Addiction, whether to a mind-altering chemical or to an unhappy relationship, ultimately affects every area of the addict's life in a progressively disastrous way. 
and consider their similar recovery paths. Admitting helplessness to control disease. Ceasing to blame others for problems. Focusing on self. Taking responsibility for own actions. Seeking help for recovery from peers. Beginning to deal with own feelings rather than avoiding them. Building a circle of well friends, healthy interests. This style of relating is typically a way to avoid fixing one's own life. It's always easier to zero in on someone else's flaws, fix their life, than their own. And there's that resolve. I can fix him. I can help him get sober. If I pour enough love and healing into this guy, he'll change. Similarly, the addict turns to their substance of choice as a means to avoid fixing one's own life, looking at their own problems. And many times, the addict and the relationally addicted women are a match made in hell, but it initially feels like heaven. They are attracted to one another because they play into one another's addictions nicely, and the two can pursue a path of mutual destruction. The woman who loves too much is magnetized to his coldness, his woundedness, his need for her to take care of him. She tends to fall on the anxious style of attachment, which is on the opposite side of the spectrum as love-avoidant people who are emotionally unavailable. Love-avoidant people typically have their own addiction outside of love, zoning out with their own favorite way to escaping their problems. While she chases him, the addict can chase his desired high. The addict can depend on the woman to take care of him while progressing even more so into the disease. Together, the two keep one another sicker and give each other what they want in a twisted way. Avoiding true intimacy. It's difficult for the wounded individual to heal in an environment where the flaw is what initially bonded the two of them together. If the capacity of how she relates to a man is how much she takes care of him, what happens when he gets better? How will the couple connect? How will they bond? How can they evolve from their set roles of person in need? and person and devotion, the wounded, caretaking relationship just keeps both parties sicker because giving up their addictions or their highs would dissolve the relationship. Without the dramatic roller coaster, ascents and declines, a healthy relationship can feel boring. They've been relating to one another and creating a relationship with such intense extremities attached. People are who they are. Women who love too much typically fall for someone's potential rather than who they are. They glaze over the sickness, the addiction, and the emotionally detachment and expand the positive traits they see. This woman will hold on to that hope that she'll be the one who can make him better. And in fact, shouldn't she help when she has all this love to give? Wouldn't walk away, just be cruel? The trouble with cyclically attracting damaged partners is that no matter how loving, how available, how sweet you are to them, the healing journey is one that ultimately comes from within. The desire to change, quit drinking, stop cheating, be a better person needs to be intrinsically motivated. No matter how much love you have to give, Know that you cannot make someone better. You cannot make them change. Acknowledging a cycle is the first step to breaking it. Just by admitting you're systematically pursuing broken, emotionally unavailable, or addicted men means you can start to analyze your own psychology, which glorifies these men. The journey of self-love begins there. Get a plant or a pet to pour your nurturing energy into. Devote yourself to a hobby. Give yourself a year of absolutely no dating to get super clear on your own energies. 
The first step of breaking the cycle of loving too much is to pour all of that nurturing, compassionate energy into yourself. When you form a genuine relationship with yourself and with God or the universe or spirit, whatever you want to call it, you find that the answer that love is as an archetype doesn't exist outside of you. It never has. It's always been within. You are love. And when you realize and stand fiercely in that truth, you'll find emotionally unavailable partners aren't able to give you the love and affection you deserve, and you'll stop being attracted to them. The cycle ends now. Take care of you first. So this was a very well-written article, and I hope I did it justice in the reading. Again, young lady's name is Haley Pace. That's H-A-L-E-Y. Pace is P-A-C-E. That's Papa Alpha Charlie Echo. And uh, the website is psiloveyou.xyz. I mm, didn't even know that was a domain. But um, I think that's dope. I think that's uh, that's dope, and uh, I hope I did the article justice. So, for those of you who are still here and who have decided to stick around, <laughs> I appreciate you hanging out with me, and I hope I've given you a lot to think about. I personally think that, again, at the end of it all, um, find a mentor, whether that, that is in relationships, whether that is in your hobbies or professional pursuits, and help them to help you look inside yourself because whether it be the topic we talked about about men fixing women or women fixing men or whether it was the topic we talked about previous to that when it came to being a creator and creating good stuff creating good work you need to take a look at yourself it all starts in the inside i'll let you all go i'll let you enjoy the rest of your day your rest of your week the rest of your month and hopefully i'll be talking to you or seeing you all soon. As always, I'll keep talking if you'll listen. Take care.